ways to build program around restorative justice. The other side of that is that many of us understand restorative justice as a social movement. And as a social movement, it has a lot of um, uh, freedom and has a tendency to react to structure. It seems that sometimes we think structure and organization will hinder our creativity. Again, I call us back to reality. Ultimately, we find ourselves needing to work through organizations. And in the restorative justice field, these are not just any organizations. These are not just any nonprofit. And many of us who've had experience in starting various organizations, and our guests will speak to that, can tell you about some of the particulars. And I think one of the most important things that we need to understand as restorative justice practitioners, and particularly those important in, uh, interested in starting their own organizations, is that we need to start organizations, if they're gonna be with integrity, they need to be coherent and consistent with RJ values and processes. And that's one of the unique reasons why we set this theme up particularly, because RJ organizations have a character of their own. Today we have uh, two uh, guests on, on, the sh on, the, on the webinar, Howard Zaer uh, and Lorraine stutzman onstutz both who have decades of experience. And I'm just going to make a few comments by introduction for the two of them. and. Uh, we'll move ahead to look at the agenda. Lorraine stutzman Amstutz is the co-director of the Office on Justice and Peacebuilding for Mennonite Central Committee. She serves as a consultant and trainer for restorative justice programs, having a victim offender mediation component and has worked in the field of victim offender mediation since 1984. She has co-authored a curriculum entitled Victim Offender Conferencing in Pennsylvania's Juvenile Justice System and two books, The Little Book of Restorative Discipline for Schools and what will happen to me. Stutz, Stutzman on Stutz, Lorraine is also the author of a little book of victim offender conferencing. She received her BS in social work from Eastern Mennonite University, where in 2002, she was awarded the Distinguished Service Award and holds a master's in social work from Marywood University. Our second guest, Howard Zare, is widely known as the grandfather of restorative justice. Zare began as a practitioner and theorist in restorative justice in the late 1970s. At the foundational stage of the field, Zare continues in his third decade to deepen the principles of restorative justice and grow its practice worldwide. He has led hundreds of events in more than 25 countries and 35 states, including trainings and consultations on restorative justice, victim offender conferencing, judicial reform, and other criminal justice matters. His impact has been especially significant in the United States, Brazil, Japan, Jamaica, Northern Ireland, Britain, the Ukraine, and New Zealand. Zare's a prolific writer and editor, and many of you have probably no doubt read his books, uh, his seminal work on uh, changing lenses, a new focus for crime and justice was published originally in 1990 and has become critical to the field. He has various other books, uh, the little book of restorative justice. He's a photojournalist also and has a number of critical books that have helped us to look at the critical issues. And, in restorative justice, look at the victim's needs, uh, look at men and women who are spending time behind, behind bars. Howard has been an advocate for making the needs of victims central to the practice of restorative justice, and that has been a core theme in his work. Uh, and also Howard has brought to the field a set of values to guide our work and to look at how we do what we do with respect and dignity for all people. It's been my pleasure to work with both Howard and Lorraine in different settings around the world, including Howard in um, South Africa. And uh, it's a blessing to be able to present them to you and allow them to uh, speak to this important subject today. We're gonna look at the agenda before I turn it over to Howard and Lorraine, uh, just to go over that uh, for you. We will be, um, after this introductory re remarks, we're going to hear from both Lorraine and Howard, and they're going to give you the context in which they are coming from, which will help you understand their remarks more significantly. And each of them will then make some presentation on the specific theme for 10 to 12 minutes. Then we'll have a time for you to um, put forward your questions, and we'll have ample time at the end for question and answer, and then concluding remarks in the last few minutes. So Howard and Lorraine, welcome. And I'm going to invite uh, you. I think, Howard, you're going to be starting to give us a little bit of the context and where you come from. 
so that our our um, listeners can get a sense of your experience and what you what the context is that you'll be speaking out of. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Carl. Can you hear me all right? I gather you must. Um, well, it's nice to be here. Thanks, Carl, for hosting this one. Uh, it's nice to be in a different role here. We think it might be useful for you to hear what we're the context we're speaking from. Uh, as Carl said, I got involved in this work back in the late 70s. I was director of what's sometimes called the first restorative justice program in the U.S., although there were certainly precedents for it. And Lorraine joined me soon after that, so the two of us have been working together for years. Almost as soon as we started, people started coming from around the world trying to find out what this was and how to do it. And so I was in a position, I had actually the position, a version of the position that Lorraine has now for all through the 80s into the 90s. And a lot of what I was doing was helping communities start programs. So communities would often call me in to consult or brainstorm or to speak when it's appropriate. When it's appropriate, we'll talk a little later about when it's appropriate and when it's not have such an outsider. Uh, so I had, a, I had a lot of experience. I have done less of that in the last uh, decade, it's still a little bit, um, but that's, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, Lorraine, tell us a little bit about where you're coming from. Well, as Howard already said, um, I started in the field uh, after he did. I actually started working for MCC uh, right after I arrived, graduated from what was then Eastern Mennonite College back in 1981. And um, one of the things I recognized when I first started with my bachelor's in social work is I had done my undergrad work in social work, working in uh, juvenile justice and had worked uh, as a probation officer and did my practicum in that area, uh, juvenile probation for a year and a half. And, and one of the things I recognized when I first came to MCC and started reading um, about victim offender reconciliation programs was the recognition that in a year and a half that I had worked in juvenile probation, I had never talked to a victim. So this idea of actually, um, you know, thinking about victims as being alienated from the system and, and not involved at all was one that certainly resonated for me as I was reading about victim offender reconciliation programs and how, uh, what a novel idea to bring victims and have them involved in some kind of dialogue with the person who has harmed them. So it was, uh, something that uh, captured my, my interest and my passion, and I was soon uh, out in Elkhart and um, working with Howard and working with, uh, with that program. That was the first program in the U.S. And, and again, I think one of the things that's important to say is as you're hearing from us today, you're obviously hearing it from the context for which uh, we came to know it and the context that we worked in and certainly have recognized that there were lots of processes and practices of restorative justice uh, already being done and have been done historically that we didn't invent it and uh, we simply put it into some kind of context that works for us but it's also a very particular perspective so I think that's also just important to recognize as we're um, talking today um, and as Howard said I, I, I stayed in the field and I kind of followed him around for a while taking um, working with him in various places and eventually thankfully you know kicked him out of MCC and sent him down to EMU so that I could just take over the job here. So um, we, the, the 30 years we've worked together have been wonderful ones, and, and so it's always fun to do these kinds of things together as well. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Lorraine and Howard. And I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over, Howard, to you to go ahead and give us your input uh, and your presentation. And Lorraine, let you follow after that. All right, and Brian, you'll put up my PowerPoint here, I think, it now. We'll take, have a second here while that yeah. comes up. There you go, and I just made you the presenter, so you can click on the appropriate one up top. I think it was that uh, starting RJ tab. You got that? There you go. No, I'm, what I'm seeing here is the... Look right the, above... Look right above that clicker and, and look for that ah. third tab starting RJ. There you go. Like that. All right. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, uh, what way we've decided, divided this is that I'm going to talk about more about organizational issues, and Lorraine is going to talk more about the programmatic issues you have to start to address when you're starting a program. We're uh, 
I think one of the first questions one has to ask oneself, and it's not, it's a question you keep asking, but what are the issues in the community that are motivating you? What are you trying, hoping to address? Are you concerned about the violence in your community? Are you concerned about the way the criminal justice is functioning, about the way victims are being left out, offenders aren't being held accountable, about overuse of jail? Those kind of issues are important to think about as you start, because they will affect are you concerned about addressing disproportionate minority contact? If you are, that will affect the kind of program and the place in the system that you choose to, to uh, intervene. Now, we are assuming here that you're interested in starting a restorative justice program that is community-based, but it's probably is going to work with the justice system in some way. That's where we have, two of us have most of our experience of starting programs that are working at some stage, please, uh, with prosecutors, with judges and probation, somewhere in there to provide opportunities for victims and offenders to meet. Uh, what we talk about here will be of use in other contexts, but that's where we're coming from. If schools are your main interest, Lorraine may have, will have some things to say about that, but that's not our primary focus today. Kay Paranis went on uh, to really pioneer the use of circles in, in community building. Uh, and we will not be talking about that, but she has given me some material that she wrote some years ago to put on our website and uh, to, about suggestions for doing that. So uh, you may want to look at our website in a while when we get that up and, and see what's there. She was very successful in Minnesota in helping communities start a variety of programs. So these are some starting ideas. Um, the keys, I think, are, are finding who the interested people and groups are in the community assessing what the community's resources are, what their needs are, what their interest is, and then providing models, options for models and building relationships. And I'll be talking about that here. So we underlying this is an assumption, and that is that we believe restorative justice has the potential to create new collaborative relationships between the community and the system of professionals. Professional, we, we need professionals need us in the community, and the community needs professionals. I think the question is how do we get a healthier and more collaborative relationship there? Albert Duzer's new book, Punishment, Participatory Democracy, and the Jury, makes that argument. He's he sees a redefined jury role as a way to do that, but it's coming from the same point. Community needs professionals. Professionals need community, and we need to find a more collaborative way to work together. We're going to draw here from a resource that Carl mentioned that's on the web. Lorraine and I wrote this for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It's, it's dated, but I think there's a lot of useful material in it, yet people say. And if you Google this, you'll find it on uh, Mennonite Central Committee's website, Victim Offender Conferencing in Pennsylvania Juvenile Justice System. If you Google that, you will find that PDF, uh, and you're welcome to use it however you want to. So I'm going to talk here about six steps briefly, and then some points of advice and warning. And uh, then Lorraine is going to pick it up on the programmatic thing, and then we'll see what questions and comments you have. The first two stages kind of come together, and that is you, you need to plant the idea, test the idea, and at the same time, you're probably trying to assess out, assess what interest there might be in the community, what the needs are in the community, what the interest is in the community. Sometimes the starting point for this is to meet with established groups like church groups and ministerial associations and other kinds of organizations, Rotary Club, those kinds of things. Sometimes people call meetings together to explore together, maybe have a circle process as a way to do it. One very powerful methodology that Tim Rupke and Nathan Barge used to start the program here in our community grew from something called listening project methodology. It was developed by uh, Southern, Voice, Rural, Southern Rural Voices for Peace, I believe it's called. And it's a way of going into community with some structured open-ended questions that help us figure out what the community's needs and resources are and plants the idea of restorative justice and sees what happens and, see, and sees what interest there is. So they began by ministers and they went and they would ask them questions about whether they knew victims and whether they had offenders in their congregation. And then, and then they would go and say, now here's an idea of restorative justice, doesn't this interest you? And then they went to victim services and they went to probation and they went to judges 
And they not only came out of that with such an incredible con idea of what the resources and needs were of each of those participants and stakeholders, but they've gotten a lot of buy-in and were able to start very quickly that way. Um, part of what one can do in that process is, uh, I mean, it's important in that process to have an exploratory, invitational kind of atmosphere to it so that people don't think you're preaching to them or, or telling them what they have to do. I'll say more about that. But that's the initial two stages. Uh, the third one is beginning to develop the idea. Usually what a group, is, once serious interest starts emerging, the group will set up a kind of advisory group. Uh, those groups, you want to have some key people in those from the community and from the system, often a probation officer, an interested prosecutor, an interested police officer, uh, a group that can begin exploring together what the possibilities are in looking at the possible models and how they might fit the community. Um, the model should always be taken as a starting point. They have to be contextualized, but they can give you ideas what the possibilities are. That group should usually talk also about the philosophy and the values that underlies their work. I find that if you don't do that till late in the process, you sometimes find you have huge differences that become a problem. And then out of that, usually a kind of concept, short concept paper is developed that can then be taken more formally to stakeholders in the system in the community. Next step, number four, is finding an entree point. Uh, who are the people in the system in the community who are most open to this, who are willing to try it out? Judges, probation officers, police chiefs, other kinds of places. Often it's valuable to use some literature like the little books to hand out to people to give them background on it. Uh, sitting with them and, and saying, here, exploring with them the possibilities and the challenges. How might this help your, your job? How might it be an obstacle? What can we do to solve that? Probation officers often hate restitution, for instance. So talking with them about how a process like this can help establish restitution amounts and help in the collection of restitution can be a real selling point for probation officers. I know this is very quick. Uh, we're trying to give kind of a skeleton view and then come back to some questions and so forth. The next step often is finding an organizational base. Sometimes groups create their own 501c3. More commonly, they join up with an organization, at least tentative, uh, temporarily. I know that's what we did and others often do is find an organization that's congenial that you can, on a startup phase, uh, under operate under their umbrellas and then maybe move off on your own later. People often think that mediation centers are the logical place, but we have actually found, I think Lorena will agree with this, that they are often very problematic. They they have some real commonalities in their values and their methodologies, but it's really difficult for the system to take mediation programs seriously as a player in the criminal justice part, uh, in this criminal justice field. And then there's a the question of fine tuning the model in a pilot phase. I think it's really important when one starts off to make it clear to everybody that this is gonna be a pilot phase. We're not locked into this. If you sign on to this, you're not stuck with it. We're gonna try this out. We're gonna do some monitoring evaluation. We're gonna hear from you, so whether it's working for you and then move to a more, more ongoing phase. So very quickly, yet some advice and some warnings. One of them is that it's really, really, really important to involve, involve victims and victim support in the, in the beginning. This may lead to some difficult conversations. They may be very skeptical and sometimes rightfully so. But if you don't involve victims and victims advocates from the beginning, it's unlikely that they will buy into it later. And you're also probably going to have some blind spots. I've just talked to so many programs that felt they couldn't get victim participation and when you talk to the victim community, they said it's because they they don't know the language, they don't know the hot buttons, they, they're just going into this naive, and they didn't involve us in the planning of it to help address that. Related to that is be diverse from the start. You know, so often we who are European Americans will start a program and then we invite people of color to join us, and you know, of course nobody wants to join at that point. You need to engage the whole community right from the start. Be really careful about how and when you use so-called experts. There is a place for the people from across the border who looks like an expert to come in and legitimize it. But if you use those kind of people too early, 
what happens is that system people in the system feel like this outsider's coming in and telling them what they ought to do or what they're doing wrong. I remember in one community very early on, uh, the community invited us in. They got all the judges and the whole system together in the courthouse and had us present, had these outside experts present. And at the end of that, the presiding judge said, not, on my, not over my bed, dead body. And so we didn't, they didn't start a program until he died. Uh, they just did not use experts in the right way. The other side of it, I remember one program where they had been working for some time with the judges to start a program. And at some point, they had me come in as the expert from outside. And I sat down with the fellow that was going to run the program and the judge. And the judge said, who is going to run this program? And I said, Ron is. And Ron said it was like the, the legitimacy passed from him to me. I had legitimized him. And from then on, they looked to him and not to me. So there's kind of a role for the outsider to bless things at the right time. But be careful about that. Don't, I, one of my advice would be don't try to take a model that you found and just try to implement it in your community, but rather, I think programs, models need to be contextualized. They need to be developed out of the community. So I think one of the part of the genius of what Kay Pranis did in Minnesota, Kay was working for the Department of Corrections at that time. She was a just, restorative justice planner. She called herself the restorative justice planter. But what she would do is have his conversations in the communities about their needs and resources. And then she would present a whole variety of models and say, what can we take from these? Which ones fit your community? So in Minnesota today, there's a huge variety of models operating. I think it's really important not to gloss over the difficulties and the limits and related that to make inflated claims or promises. Uh, first of all, you won't be believed if you are making claims that are pie in the sky. And secondly, you have to live up to them. So you get going and then you can't deliver what you promised and it gets in a very difficult situation. And finally, be respectful of professionals. They are doing a job there. They are important. Uh, it's very important not to disrespect them or to act like they are not playing an important role. Again, our goal here is a new kind of collaboration between mm -hmm. professionals in the system and the justice process. And so we need to work collaboratively, collaboratively together on that. Finally, uh, building relationships is critical. A criminal justice system is basically a club. It's an insider club. And they are not going to take you seriously until you are part of that club. When we started, I spent a lot of time around the water cooler in the probation department telling jokes. Uh, just being there till they began to take me seriously as a player in the system. Uh, so spending time with them, building relationships is really important. Be really careful and strategic in using the media. Again, if you use the media too early or if it comes across too critically that in, by implication it, it's being critical of what's being done in the community, it can really turn people off and it's really hard to overcome those obstacles. On the other hand, the media can be a very good thing for you. And finally, and Lorraine and I have seen this so often, a, community, a program starts and they get a whole bunch of community people together who want to be trained and they do this training and then the cases trickle in and the facilitators, the trained facilitators get more and more frustrated and pretty soon they just drop away and you don't have facilitators. It's much better, in my opinion, to train a very small core of facilitators and do some cases, get some get some credibility, get some experience, and then begin to expand the circle of people who are trained. So that's a quick bit of information. I'm going to turn it over to Lorraine now to talk about programmatic issues and be sending your questions in and so forth to Jen, and we will have some time for questions and answers. So Lorraine, it's over to you. I first should say that the reason Howard went first is uh, only because there was a time when we presented together and it was a day that I was sick and Howard and I decided who was going to present uh, what issues and um, I was just on a roll and actually presented my part and his. So I think that's what he was really worried about this time and, and just wanted to go first so that he could get that out of the way so I wouldn't take over. I, I stood up and I had to say my part and Lorraine looks over at me and says, do you want to say something? And I said no and sat down. 
<laughs> so actually, I'm probably going to repeat some of what Howard said because some of the issues do overlap, and I think some of them are really critical, and we and and we really do want you to keep them um, in the forefront. Um, let me find this second one. So I'm going to start. Well, one of those things that um, when when Howard was talking about how we become known within the system, and I think there's always that fine line between whether you um, you become well, I want to say corrupted, co-opted by the system, perhaps, and and how you maintain that balance of also building relationships. And I remember when we were in Elkhart at one point, um, I one of the probation officers invited me to their uh, Halloween party. And so we were standing in the middle having this discussion about the Halloween party, and I made a comment that um, I had never been invited to a probation party before. And one of the probation officers looked at me and said, you mean you don't work here? Um, so, you know, there was something about having built that, um, you know, that, that collegiality, those relationships to the point where they weren't sure, you know, who I worked for, but they knew they were referring me cases, so I guess that was a good thing. But thinking about um, program models, and, and how, again, Howard talked about some of this, about what is your uh, basic program model, and I think that's really important, and I know that we're focusing primarily on um, victim offender and, and working within uh, the, the legal system, so we'll stay focused on that, but I think uh, it, it does, doesn't mean that you won't think about other things, and I think it's really important to, to know which one you're working at and having that set ahead of time. You know, as, as what this sign reminds me of the saying that um, if you don't know where you're going, any old road will do. So have make sure you've assessed that. Make sure you know what the local resources are, what the needs are, uh, what fits your community. As Howard said, there isn't a cookie cutter approach. Uh, we did the manual, um, and on the bottom of my PowerPoint, you'll see that actually is the link to the conferencing manual that Howard put up earlier. So that will take you directly to it if you want to write down. Uh, that link uh, to our website, but I think it's it, um, you know it really is important to know how that fits your community. Some of the things we tried to say in there are some things uh, that you need to be thinking about. But what what are your community needs? And, and sometimes it is what will your community allow? Howard mentioned the program that said uh, you know not over my dead body, and it didn't happen until that juvenile justice uh, did die, and they actually do have a program in that community at this point. But, uh, but knowing that sometimes where the resistance is coming from, where are the challenges? And so that's where you really do have to make that assessment. Um, where is the motivation coming from? You know, it, uh, looking at how we talk about value, you know, is it value-driven? Sometimes programs are started because the funding is there. And, and not that that's um, necessarily um, a bad reason, because because often that comes from need and it also comes from values. But when that, that funding is there, one of the things you have to remember is that that funding is not going to stay there. And so some programs we've worked with, you know, one of the things that I've always said to programs, they'll say, we have a three-year grant to start this. And I said, that's fine. And what you should be doing from day one is looking to see where your funding is going to come from at the end of that three years. There are numerous programs that we could cite that at the end of the grant period hold it. Um, simply because they hadn't done that groundwork of being able to establish what's going to happen when that funding isn't there, and also buy in from the community. Um, it's easy to say yes to something when you come with your own money, um, but, but how, where do you get that buy-in? Uh, does it not meet the community needs? And so at the end of that time, it really uh, is let go, and the system is not committed to it. People from within the community are not committed to it. So I think that's really important um, to have that understanding of why you're starting, where it's coming from, and then who is the primary focus. Um, I know we're talking specifically about uh, the victim, the offender, uh, the community, but, but also looking at schools. I mean, there are programs very specifically focused on doing conferences within schools. And so, again, just knowing uh, who you're hoping to impact, where that's going to Start from because that's where you want to start building that support. And so having that sense of what the needs are is really important as you think about what the primary focus is going to be. And even more specifically, whether you're going to be working um, specifically with juveniles, whether you're going to be working with adults, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but just to follow up then with the operational issues, and again, how we talked about this, where is it going, where is the program going to be housed? For instance, one of the things when we talk about um, dialogues and crimes of severe violence, 
right now in in each of the 25 states that are housed that have a program in crimes of severe violence, it's, it's housed in victim services. And there's some very specific reasons why it's housed in victim services. But, you know, that's what you have to be aware of. There is actually one uh, program that's uh, in the very early stages of development in crimes of severe violence dialogue. And the victim services in that state is not, uh, doesn't have the resources to, to run that program. And so they're looking to a community organization, the first one that I'm more aware of in the U.S., uh, to actually house the program, but you have to be aware of what those issues are um, if that's going to, to be the case. Uh, victim services really does have to be on, on board with that, can't be brought on later, as Howard mentioned. They need to be, uh, they, they are a stakeholder and they need to have to say, um, the victim advocate uh, that was appointed that by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we have a governor appointed uh, victim advocate, and she and I used to do a workshop together, and so we, we spent a lot of time uh, sitting down together talking about what some of the impressions were of one another, what, what victim services think about restorative justice, for example, what restorative justice thinks about victim services. And one of the things that um, that I would say to her is that, well, victim services, the answer is always no. Um, they, they own the victim, so the answer is always no. And she said, well, um, partly how victim services feel is that you won't come, you won't come talk to us. You let us know after the fact and say, do you want to jump on board with it? So, you know, one of the things we ended our workshop by saying is, uh, what do you do if someone initially that you talk to says, no, we're not interested? Well, the reality is you go back again. So you continue to build that relationship and find out where the challenges are coming from, and you continue to address them because often they're coming from a place of either fear. Uh, sometimes it's because they're worried about all that, that they've had to do to get to the place where they've gotten to in terms of victim rights and victim services, and now that pot of money has to be further divided. And so, um, you know, there's that issue of how, how is that going to happen, and you're going to be going for the same pot of money that they are. So how do you talk about working at that together? So I think looking at where it's going to be housed and who's going to be, um, who's going to be working at that is really critical. Uh, how will programmatic oversight be provided? And again, thinking about you know whether there's an advisory board, whether there's a board of directors, all of those things need to be take, taken into consideration. Um, you know, if you're under another program um, to start out with, does that program provide uh, the oversight and their board provide oversight for your work, or is there something separate? So all of those are issues that uh, I think it's important to be able to work out ahead of time, uh, just so you again know where you're going. Just looking um, specifically at cases, what types of cases will you accept? And that comes from um, just having an idea, are you going to focus specifically on the juvenile justice system? Or are you going to look at adult cases? And, and there are reasons um, to do one or the other. Sometimes uh, I think programs who start out in the juvenile system do so because they think it's easier. The system is generally more amenable to saying, you know, the assumption that, that we want to work at rehabilitation with juveniles and we think that they're more amenable to change and they haven't fully developed. Um, those things as I would list as pros can also be listed as cons, um, but certainly there are more issues when, when working with juveniles, but ones that I think are really significant and important because I think there's more people that are brought into the conversation in terms of parents and, and school community that I think are really significant and important conversations as you think about um, hopefully what you know, the motivation behind all of this is that we want to have healthier communities coming out of any processes we enter into, um, and so it's a way of strengthening community. So working with juveniles, I think, is a, is a good way to start because I think it engages more people from within the community. Um, where in the system or community will you receive cases? Generally, we say those referrals uh, come from within the system. And, and if people have more questions about that, we can talk about it. But, um, you know, where the system matters, sometimes there are programs that are doing cases, um, for instance, once um, if it's the juvenile has been adjudicated or admits responsibility or if it's an adult that they've been found guilty, then sometimes uh, even after the sentencing has happened, when the judge has said, this is what, what's going to happen to you, often the case because they then referred to the Community Restorative Justice Program or the Victim Offender Conferencing Program, 
and you have a certain amount of time while that prob that person is on probation. It may be six months, it may be a year, but uh, the nice thing about that is that it actually gives you a bit more time to work um, on the cases because if you do it before that sentencing actually takes place, there's a more limited amount of time. So it may limit the number of cases you can actually do. So you want to be careful as you think about where in the system there may be some places where it might feel more beneficial, but can you get those done or are you setting yourself up for failure by not returning them to the referral source in time because that could be seen um, obviously as an issue for the referral source if that's not uh, being able to be done. So you really do need to think about where where it comes from and what point in the system it comes to you. Um, there were cases who were actually doing them prior to any admission, um, and sometimes those are diversion cases, diversion, diversion cases, and it may mean that um, if that case is taken care of, the system may decide they're not going to take it any further, um, and there's no record on the juvenile, um, there's no record in the system in that case, which is really a wonderful thing, but again, it's limited in the amount of time that you have. So that's one of the issues uh, just to be aware of. Um, they don't always have to come directly from the legal system or the juvenile justice system or the courts can also come from police officers. Police have a lot of discretion in communities and can have cases come uh, to the program directly from the police with the understanding that if it doesn't work out, they can always take it back uh, into the more formal legal system. So that's one way to also um, how it's done. Certainly in some communities, and we don't specifically address this in the in the curriculum, but when, when we look at New Zealand and recognize that cases always go to a family group conference before it ever goes into the system, and so that's the first stop. We're, we're not quite at that place. There might be some communities who are actually trying that, but um, but we're talking about a pretty traditional victim offender conferencing model. We can, we can maybe talk about some of those other things if you're interested. Um, I already mentioned some of the, the special issues with juveniles. One is, you know, I can remember when we first started in Elkhart that um, when we would talk to parents about their children, and, and I can talk about these things now that I'm a parent of three children because I know how parents, I know how I can be. Uh, we can, parents um, are an interesting, you know, mix uh, to throw into this. Um, we, we will have parents who would say, uh, for instance, my child would never have done anything like this. They were the most wonderful, amazing child. It had to be someone else's fault. Um, so you have parents who are kind of denying that responsibility for their child. And you have others who say, you know, my child has been nothing but trouble from the day he or she was born. You know, just take them and fix them. We don't care. We don't even want to be there. So we have, you know, in that spectrum, I think I, I've seen it all of where parents fall on that. And I think there were, there were, Times when we really very specifically thought about victim offender conferencing or victim offender reconciliation as one victim and one offender. And if the parents couldn't be there, we kind of do a little happy dance because it was kind of nice not to have the parents involved because you never, you know, they're kind of that unknown of what's going to happen. Um, but the reality, I think, that we've learned over the years is they need to be involved. And I think most programs would say that. We're about building healthy communities. And so when we leave, significant people in this person, in this juvenile's life, or even in this adult's life, if we leave them out of these processes, then are we really talking about building healthy community because they need to be part of it. And it may make it more complicated, it may make it more messy, but they need to be involved. And I think that's, that's really significant. And when you work with juveniles, that's obviously going to be uh, a very critical part is uh, those family dynamics or those support people or parents uh, who are going to be involved. Um, asking whether this is a voluntary process for participants, I think that's a really critical question and one that I know for a number of years programs went round and round about. Certainly there's no question that it's voluntary for the victims. There's, that's never an issue. If a victim says, I'm, I, I don't want to go any further, then it stops. There was more of a question, we say it's voluntary for all participants. What some programs would do, um, they were finding that it was actually probation officers or judges who were trying to give information to participants to say this is what it is um, without really having ever gone through a training of what this, this dialogue really is. And so uh, immediately they were getting no. Um, the other issue we were having, I know for a while, was that 
there were, um, you know, it, it, it's volunteers within the community who are doing these cases. And so if someone's doing one or two, you know, every few months or one or two a year, they don't necessarily feel comfortable uh, knowing exactly how to answer questions or what to say when things come up. And so it's kind of the easy answer is no. And, and so one of the things that we say is to make sure that it's, it's those who feel comfortable answering those questions, um, the idea is not just to get an answer over the phone, but actually a face-to-face -face meeting with the participant um, to say, this is what it is, and let me know what your questions are because we can help answer those. Where is that no coming from? So probation would start by saying, you don't have to agree to go through this dialogue with the victim, but you do have to agree to meet with the staff person from the victim offender program or the facilitator because we want you to hear from them rather than from us because we don't have as much information about what this is. And so I think that's a really critical step. So they may mandate, they may make it a part of the restitution or the agreement with the court to say you need to meet with the staff person, but as facilitators of a process, we may then say, um, you've met that requirement by meeting with us, but you can still say no if you choose not to actually go through and meet with the with the victim. So uh, another uh, way that we would frame that sometimes with, um, with people when they would say, is it voluntary, I can say no, and we would say, absolutely, you can say no. Uh, the reality is that people want to say no. Who who really wants to go back and meet with the person that they harm? It's very frightening. Um, I don't think I've ever seen anyone more frightened than taking uh, someone into a room with the person that they've harmed. It's a very frightening process for them to think about. Um, and so we say no, but one of the things we also say is you can say no, but um, just know that you need to go back and tell the judge that. Um, you know, I don't know what the judge will do with that, which is true. You won't. You don't know what, what happens with that from that, that point on. So um, sometimes we coin the phrase voluntary, um, coercive voluntariness um, on the on the part of particularly uh, the person who harmed and whether they want to go forward. Um, just thinking about um, some of the operational issues, and then I um, I know that we need I want to be done so that you have time to ask questions. Um, you know, how will facilitators be trained and supervised? Uh, Howard already talked about that in terms of not too many. And one of the things I would say is not too soon. You know, one of the things we found is uh, I would be invited by programs to come and I have 30 facilitators to be trained. And I learned to ask questions of, do you know where the cases are coming from? Do you have cases that you're all ready to take? And they say, oh, no, we're developing it. They may maybe another six months or a year away from actually developing how cases are going to come to them. And if you don't have facilitators ready to go with cases once they're trained, then again, you're going to lose them. So either you have too many to start with or you train them too soon. So there's also that balance of, of how you do that. And then also who they're going to be, how about any supervised? It's critical that if you're having community volunteers doing these uh, cases, they really need to have um, someone that they can debrief with, and that's and, and someone that they can call and say, well, I got stuck on this question. So there are always you need to know who's going to be in contact with those facilitators on a regular, ongoing basis is really key. Um, because if not, you're going to lose them because they're going to feel like they really don't know what they're doing. Who maintains contact, who maintains contact with the referral source? Generally, in programs, there's also one person who does that, one or two. Um, one of the things that you'll find with referral sources generally is they don't want 15 facilitators calling them saying, um, I have a case that I, I know came from you as a probation officer, and I want to know if you have a new phone number that I can reach this person. So just know who's going to maintain that contact with the referral source. Generally, it's the program. Whoever is um, working with facilitators and the referral source needs to be that, that person who's, who's making contact. Um, who contacts participants? Uh, that's also a critical one, and again, that goes back to my earlier point about how how you get people to engage in the process. There will be some facilitators who will just say, I do not feel comfortable making that cold call or making that initial call uh, with the victim or the offenders, and sometimes that's also done at the, at the program. And, and that's important because uh, all that person is doing is making sure not that they'll agree to come face to face, but that they'll agree to meet with the facilitator to talk about what the program is. So that's also, I think, a, a pretty key issue. Um, what forms will be used? Again, it's just knowing what that's going to look like. 
what uh, once you go into that meeting, what the forum is going to be, and and that's something that you'll talk about kind of with your vision and mission, and what do you want the end to look like. But also, this is a form that could be used to send back to the referral source. So, uh, I used to say in Elkhart, we used to send three, four, five page reports. I used to tell my facilitators, I want you to write everything down that happened because I'm not there, and I want I want to feel at the end of reading your report that um, I was there. Well, we actually found for lots of reasons as we moved into um, more litigious issues that we really didn't want to know everything that had happened in that meeting. And we didn't think that was fair to the victim and the offender to have everyone reading that and not even necessarily in the referral source. So we stopped and, and started by saying just bring back the agreement form. Um, and particularly if people um, decided not to meet, uh, did we want that to further harm the offender just because they decided not to meet, do we want to put in the report that they were um, they were not cooperative? Um, and that's, you know, if this is a voluntary uh, process, then that's not language that we should necessarily be using, but some programs were. So I think those are also um, key questions. How will agreements be monitored? Um, just as important as the meeting is who's going to follow up. So I think, um, I think there can be more damage done if no one follows up with the agreement than not having the meeting at all. So that's really another critical piece. Who's going to be making sure that whatever they agree to is all, um, contacting the offender to find out, um, are you are you paying the $10 a week that you agreed to pay? Are you mowing the lawn that you agreed to mow? Uh, are you contacting victims to make sure they got that? Um, where do they need to be getting it from? Um, that's a really critical piece. So we, we always would just call that restitution pending. And when we talk about restitution, know that that's always very symbolic. Uh, we know that it's not possible to give back or to put things right that has been harmed, but we do that um, as much as possible. Uh, what kind of reports will be made to the referral source? That goes back to the earlier statement of not writing, necessarily writing a five-page history of what happened, but it might just be the agreement. Form. But that's partly something that has to be worked out with the referral source as well. So, so um, that was maybe kind of the, the, the quick and dirty of uh, operational issues and cases and how you move forward. But um, I don't know, Howard, if you want to add anything to it before we open it up that I missed or where you want to go from here? I think we can open it up. Uh, uh, Jen, you have some questions there that you can share with us. Uh, Carl's going to hit coordinate this part. Yes, thank you very much. And um, to both of the presenters, and I think you've given us a lot of things to chew on, to think through, and it, both some of the detail. And I think we're looking at a great set of questions here. Thank you for those who've sent in some questions. We're going to move the discussion with some of these questions into a few different themes right now. We have some questions around models and development of program and some issues around stakeholders and power. So I'm going to pull a few questions from these different themes and let both of the um, panelists, guest panelists, speak to that. The first one is very interesting and I think must be connected to um, the the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander's book that's, that's uh, spreading like wildfire in many ways and being discussed in many different places across this country and beyond. The question is, I'm working on setting up RJ for cradle to prison pipeline which refers to the new drug laws that have led to a burgeoning prison population in the US. One problem is the lack of a clear victim in many of these cases, e.g. conspiracy or simple possession charges. What can the offenders do or offer as a restorative or transformative practice to the community and the supposed victim? You, how, how do we want to handle this? The, if you want it, just one of us. Lorraine, do you want to pick it up, or Carl, you want to start? Tell us who to start. With? How, how should we handle this? I'm happy if either if either of you find you want to bite on a, on the on the question, go for it. Well, would you right. give Lorraine the hard ones, and I'll take the easy ones. Okay, then that one's for Lorraine. So which one is which one is this, Howard? Is this an, <laughs> I, I I have a thought about it anyway, um, and then you can jump in. Okay. One of the things, you know, it's always interesting to me when I hear the comment that when there's not a clear victim because. I don't think there's any such thing as a victimless crime, and I know when you're talking about conspiracy or you're talking about drugs, but I think there is always significant to find someone within that person's community that can sit with them and talk to them about the impact of whatever the harm is. 
And, and I think that's really important. And I think uh, certainly within communities, there would be people who would be able to say, um, this is how we're impacted by your behavior. And I think uh, whether it's a panel, and you know, we have panel, we have victim panels, we have there's all we have community panels that happen uh, when the actual victim, or if there isn't an actual victim that can participate. And so I think it's really important for offenders to hear the stories from those who have been impacted by whatever the harm is, um, so that they have an understanding that it's not just victimless, it's not just it's not harming anyone, it's just them. Um, I think that that would be critical. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, just some examples. I knew a, a big city prosecutor who had done a drug bust in the inner city, and his plan was to hold a circle with the community uh, between these drug dealers and the community to discuss the harms and the needs and accountability. Uh, there is some helpful literature in the, the university conduct field because so much of the university conduct uh, infractions revolve around things like drugs and alcohol. And so you might find that useful. We talked about that in the last webinar. Uh, some. The other issue I'd say if we're trying to address disproportionate minority contact is to think very seriously about where this intervention is happening, how to make sure it isn't uh, primarily made available to white folks and not people of color and how they're actually impacted as opposed to just making space in the system for another person to come in. So some of the most interesting stuff being done is um, like in the Bay Area where they're, they're doing family group conferencing at, in cooperation with the prosecutor as a way to keep kids of color out of the system entirely. And they do it, they have an agreement with the prosecutor where they can use what Sujatha Baliga calls a reverse Miranda rule. They can they have the right to read to say to these kids, anything you, you say in this meeting will not be used against you. Uh, they are doing something similar in some other communities. And so not only are they using this restorative process, but they're doing it in such a way that actually diverts uh, people out of the system entirely. So that's the other thing to think about, I think. Uh, in this. There's a lot more we could say about that. We probably ought to need more to move on to the next question. That's what we'll say when we don't have an answer. Huh? Uh, yeah, that's right. We ramble when we don't have an answer. I hope no one noticed that. But one of the things I did want to bring up when you talked about that idea of the cradle to prison pipeline, um, particularly if you're working in schools and meeting, uh, or if you're working in schools or even just in the community, one really important study that I think really highlights this dilemma of the school to prison pipeline is the Texas study that was just done with 1 million students over a six year period that um, talks about the higher incidence, uh, for one thing, of children of color who were even receiving suspension, but then just the numbers who within a year were involved in the legal system once they had been suspended from school. So it's a really wonderful study. Um, if you Google it, um, you, you can find it. I don't have the link right here. Maybe we can put it on the website later. But I think that would be a really critical piece to have just to highlight some of the very specific issues on uh, the school to prison pipeline, very specifically and the minority, uh, those students who uh, are being suspended from school and then moving into the legal system and the disproportionate representation uh, that this study highlights. Wonderful, good resources, and these are critical things to think about. I think in, in a brief to that question, we need to also think about the fact that RJ needs to address moving away from the individualistic focus of our current criminal justice system and starting to look at collective and corporate harm. And if we begin to see it that way and can begin to work at that mind shift, uh, it, it, it does make a difference. I just came from the Chicago area where there's folks working on what they're calling restorative hubs where they've made contact with the schools and the criminal justice system and the community, they're running public circle processes, which are open to the public and, and, and drawing in uh, gang members uh, into these circle processes to talk about issues in the community and on the street and in their lives. And this has been quite transformative. And uh, they're looking to sort of set these kind of hubs up in five different areas of Chicago City. So there's some creative thinking going in this regard. I'm going to move on because we've got a, uh, quite a number of good questions uh, rolling in. Uh, the under development, someone's asking, how does one reach out to a stakeholder group 
when there is no centralized group or collective. This was back to looking at how do we, I think this came around the time when you, uh, as, lecture, uh, as the guest panelists were speaking about how bringing in the victim's voice or the victim's groups into the RJ process as much as possible. And I think um, someone's asking here, what happens when you don't have an organized victim's group? You want me to start, Lorraine? You started last time. Um, well, there, there are always victims. There doesn't have to be an organized group. There are always victims in the community. So finding those, reaching out to them. But the other thing is that every community has victim assistance. I think every pro community now has a victim assistance, victim witness person often associated with the prosecutor's office, but they're important stakeholders to, to draw into this. Uh, the listening project methodology here was a very good way to, to incorporate their views and interests right from the start. Uh, so I think it's a combination of those. There are people in all of our communities, I think, designated to work with victims. There may not be organized victim groups or victim advocacy groups, but I bet you there, I mean, every state has them. So even if they're not, in your specific community, there will be some in the state who will know, who will have contacts who are worth having having uh, conversations with. Lorraine, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, one of the thoughts that I have is, um, I guess may, may, perhaps we shouldn't make the assumption that we're talking to everyone within a U.S. context, yeah, um, even though that that's our experience. And so there may be places where there aren't um, established victim groups, but I think it's important what Howard said is there are people within the community who um, who, who hold some power and whether it's because they've been victimized or they've worked at issues of victimization, but I think it's still finding, you know, maybe that's again where that listening project comes in because you simply need to find who those people are um, and it's by building relationships that you find who those people are. Uh, so that you start making those web of connections so that you can find out who has some influence where. So whether it's, you know, if it's not an organized group where there's um, not someone who's specific oversight is, you know, you still, there are people who, who have needs and know about the needs of others that you need to connect to. And I think that would be really significant. Reminds me when, when the guy, there was some, some uh, NGO in Moscow, Russia that started a restorative justice, a victim offender conferencing program in Moscow. And when they wanted to start this, they went to talk to the prosecutor and the prosecutor said, you might as well not even take off your coats. I don't have time to talk about this. And they started talking about it. And a couple hours later, they couldn't get out of there because it turned out he had been a victim of a violent crime himself. And he was so frustrated with the way the criminal justice system had dealt with it that he was extremely interested. They didn't go to see him because they thought he was a victim, but there he was. So you so many people have been victimized. It's a question of finding out where the connection is and, and, and what their needs are, I think. Carl, you're, you're, uh, looks like your sound is off. Are you ready with the next question? All right. I think I kept it on and clicked it later. Uh, we've got a question rolling in here around stakeholders in power. One of the main problems I see in going from working from the local or the community level to working with government officials is that they work in a very vertical structure that yeah. needs approval from upstairs. Without this approval from upstairs, the local government officials often refuse to go forward. At least that is my experience. So this is really about this tension of working within uh, the, the, the system and how do we, how do we, get, um, how do we get attention? in a highly uh, hierarchical structure. Uh, Rain, you want to pick it up first? Well, uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely a critical issue. And again, I, I don't think there's a, a standard response, but, it, you know, one of the things that I, um, you know, is, is how you get in to be heard and, and who you want to uh, listen to. I remember when we were starting our uh, the, working at starting the program in Lancaster that I was taking a, actually taking a seminary course on church and society. And I remember going into the president's judge and um, saying I was writing a paper for a class and I wanted to interview him because I was working on this committee to help this to happen. 
And, and I remember him saying, I want to know who's involved. I want to know that you've talked to other people within the community and that um, this just isn't one group of people out to do some good thing because he knew I was coming to it from a faith perspective. But one of the things I think is important for whether it's local government or whether it's trying to get an answer from government higher up is um, knowing who you're speaking on behalf of and having done a lot of that work already from within the community. So you're doing community work without really knowing what the answer is going to be from those at the top. Um, and, and I see this, I think, also a lot with schools. I mean, sometimes it's hard because if it comes from the top, which sometimes it does, where those within the system see the need. And then sometimes it's hard just for the community buy-in because they just see, oh, this is a system trying to impose something. And then the reverse of that is the community folks trying to start something and not being able to know who to connect with in, in higher, uh, higher up in the local or uh, state government who can help them to make this happen. So I think it's all about finding those relationships um, and working at that. And, and again, it starts from listening from within the community, I think, first. In, in my experience, you go to a lot of communities and there will be judges and others who say, well, I can't do that because the law doesn't specifically provide for it. You know, and, but, I, but usually you can find a judge, a probation officer, or somebody who realizes that there is enough discretion in the in the law to do these things, even though the law doesn't specifically authorize it, there is room to do it. That's how we started in back in Indiana. We had one judge who was willing to do this. We had other judges who said, you know, the law doesn't say anything about it. I'm not going to do it. But we had we found a judge and a probation officer who realized what they were doing wasn't working well. They began to realize the value of this, and they said, we can find a way to to make this, to legally do this. So I think a lot of times when people in the system say that, it's it's because they don't want it. They, they're trying to find an excuse. So I'd say looking for the, for a person, finding a like, some kind of loophole, some kind of key, uh, what's the word I want, entry point in the system would be a, a, a step toward that way. I think we all talk about the need for finding the allies within the system. And um, finding those allies is really, really critical, uh, especially as we're looking for con people who represent a constituency who understands the issues that concern us. And um, I know one indigenous leader said, you've got to find someone who can see the issues with both eyes, not just looking at it one way. We've got, a, we've got some great questions here, so I'm going to keep moving ahead. How does one set up an RJ program if the people in general do not approve of or are not aware of the new idea of RJ value, uh, values. So we're looking at someone who's saying, yeah, I'm in a community where these values are totally foreign. How do I begin to look at, at, at working an RJ program in that setting? I would argue that there, you, you, there, are, there are gonna be people in that community who are concerned about it. They may not know about restorative justice, but you know, the concept of restorative justice in my experience, appeals across the political spectrum. And when people think about this, you know, they think about how they were brought up when they did something wrong. You find those people, those groups who are interested in that kind of dialogue. It's, they, I mean, I've worked in so many communities where they had no knowledge of restorative justice. And if you had told them you were coming in to reform the system, you would have you know, been thrown out. But when you had dialogue around the basic concept, what the needs are in the community are and so forth, Usually, you can find some allies who at least want to want to hear more. I think just to add to that, one of the things that's uh, as a way to get started, and and, and maybe a, a more of a kind of a non-threatening way, rather than to say we're coming in to tell you uh, what you don't know or or give you something that you don't know you want, is how do you start asking those questions? And so, whether it's uh, in some communities, they've just um, had a one-day forum where they brought. Uh, significant people into that, people that they know weren't in favor or, or supportive or even knowledgeable, knew anything about restorative justice, um, but invite those people in and bring someone from the outside just to talk about what their experience has been with restorative justice. It could be someone from another community who is implementing something successfully. So uh, kind of bringing that in and then allowing time for kind of those table groups where people sit around and have discussion about, well, what are the needs in our community and how do you see those being met? And is there anything that you've heard here or anything that restorative justice can speak into that? 
So again, that's how you're starting so that you, you hear what the concerns are. You don't just dismiss them. You want to know where those challenges come from from those folks or, or they're not going to be on board and they're not going to help you think about ways to implement it in your community. So it's just strategically finding ways to help them think about what the issues are and providing that. Um, so that, again, that everyone's also on the same page because they're all hearing the same information about restorative justice because you'll also hear people say, well, that's not my experience. What I've heard is it does this, or I've heard it does this. So uh, bringing those people together, I think, might be an important way to at least have them start out on the same page. But how you present it is so important to not be presented as this is the way it ought to be done or what you ought to be doing, but rather let's present this as a catalyst for conversation. Here's what some people are doing. Does this have any relevance to us? So making sure that it's invitational and not, and not something that you're trying to sell. It's just really important because that's that's where it can really go sour, I think. There's another question actually related to this, and maybe you can give some specific examples. But um, someone's asking here, what is the effective middle ground between a community with no RJ knowledge or where there's lack of resources or interest and a full fledged RJ program? In other words, I want to work towards RJ. My community is probably not ready for a full fledged program for various reasons. Are there other things I can do? And what would those things be? I guess I, I would start by saying I don't I don't know what a full fledged restorative justice program looks like um, because I think it looks so very different in different communities. And I think it's for those communities to decide what their needs are from within that community. And so it could be starting small. Um, it doesn't have to be some full-fledged program where they're taking, if that's what you consider a full-fledged program, you know, taking 500 cases a year or even 50 cases a year. But where, it, you know, does it start with a place where as a, as a community we decide to come together and talk about what our values are? And if these, you know, if we have, um, if we talk about restorative justice um, using Howard's, you know, three R's with his lovely alliteration, is it respect, responsibility, and relationship? How does that play out within our community? What does that look like within our community? Um, I remember going into a school at one point where they said, um, well, we're happy you're here because we're very anxious for you to tell us, um, you know, what, what we need to be doing. And I said, well, I, I should probably leave now because I can't tell you what you need to be doing. I can help you um, strategize and talk about what your needs are and what some, I, I think some ideas might be, but I can't fix it for you. Uh, communities are strong and they, they have the strength from within them, but they also need to know what the needs are. So I think you, you, you start small and you start talking about the idea of values and, and, and some of those principles that we talk about with restorative justice and see where it fits. Yeah. Wonderful. We, um, another question here coming around the family group conferencing. We have started up a family group conference program. We have partial buy-in, but want a deeper buy-in with probation and police specifically. Any insight as to how we develop this? Well, I would, I would say one thing is inviting them as appropriate to sit in on the conferences. That's been so impactful in my experience or they've been able as a police officer i'm thinking of one here in town where the police officer was so skeptical and then when when he saw what happened there saw that this uh, young man that he did not believe was capable of taking responsibility see him taking responsibility there and so forth became a real advocate and i've seen that happen often so that's that's one thing Do you have other ideas lorraine I, I don't know. I mean, I think we talk so much about that idea of relationship building, that that really is how it, it has to happen. Um, it doesn't necessarily work to go to, you know, the person above them and say, can you make them come um, or can you make them like this? It really is about um, finding out what is it about this that you have, um, you know, that you think is a challenge or that you think is not working and trying addressing that. So it really is developing that one on one relationship. And inviting them into see processes is, is certainly one of the most significant ways, I think, for people to have an idea of, oh, this can work. I think people feel like, um, you know, when we talk about stories and when we say this is really what happened, people mostly say, well, you're only telling us the good stuff. There has to be an equal number of cases that go really badly. 
and and people are just coming at coming at it from that place of uh, assuming there's failure instead of assuming there's success. I mean, I think it depends, you know, whether you're looking at the glass of half empty or half full. And so I think it's continuing to maintain relationship with those people and inviting them into processes so you under have more of an understanding. I mean, it might be to say, no matter what you do, say I don't, I, I'm not supportive. Um, but on the other hand, maybe they can at least get to a place where they don't block it, even if they're not sure this is the best way to go. If the issue, as it often is, is about getting case referrals, uh, I think it's really important to work at what I call active, uh, active recruitment of cases as opposed to passive. That is, if you sit and wait for people to send referrals, even if they give all kinds of lip service, the police and the prosecutor and so forth, you get very few. Somehow getting on the inside, for instance, uh, in one time here in our community, our staff had the had the permission to go in and look at the court dockets every every week and say which cases they thought might be appropriate. Uh, also, it worked best when we have somebody in the courtroom. So on, on appropriate days, we had a staff person in the in the courtroom, so they would be reminded we're there. They could talk to us about what is appropriate case. We used to laugh. We were going to make T-shirts and have people get up and flag when they wanted to have our staff. Uh, wanted a case they could get up and flash the t-shirt that said forfeit but anyway we didn't do that but uh, but I think it is really important to to get on the inside and be an active part of the case referral process and not just sitting back and waiting for them to come I'm not sure if that's what was implied in the question but that's often the way people experience the buy-in issue I think um, maybe that goes back to what I um, talked about it in, at the very beginning when I presented talking about what happened in Elkhart. I mean, the reality was I probably walked over to probation every day. Um, and that was a way just to talk to them, not only about the cases um, that we were working on, which I could have called and done that, or I could have just sent over uh, an update form, which we often did. But it was just being there, being present, um, letting them know that I was interested not just in cases, but also in, in what was happening with other cases that we that weren't being referred. I mean, they often wanted to talk about what to do in certain situations. And so we I would spend as much time doing that as I, I think I would about our own cases. And so it's somehow, again, just showing up, I think is really critical. It's, it's relationship, relationship, relationship. <laughs> can vouch for that, certainly with the project that we ran in South Africa. Uh, our the, the community volunteers in court made a big difference. I remember one specific court where the judge was very convinced in the process, but because the, me, uh, the program was there, the restorative justice program was there, he would actually start the bench day by talking about the alternative of restorative justice if people wanted that and actually offer that alternative right there in the court. Or he said, you can come before me and go through the regular process. It's up to you. We've got these people over here. That can help you out if that's what you're interested in. A great opportunity. I'm going to keep moving us uh, forward. Um, here's another one. I'm not sure where the context may be coming from, but uh, someone asked, what do you think that in some countries where RJ is considered only available for petty crimes, isn't it unfair to say to a victim you can't take part in an RJ process because you have suffered a very serious crime? <laughs> Sure is. Uh, uh, it, it sure is. I, I'm not sure what to say, but he, exactly that. I mean, I think I think victims ought to have a right to meet their offender as long as it can be done safely. Uh, I mean, and they ought to have an informed choice. But I think victims ought to have a right to meet with the offender, even if the offender is not taking full responsibility, as long as it, they're making an informed choice and as long as it uh, can be done safely find how to get the referring system to understand that. One of the things that helps sometimes is those victims get upset and go give the system a hard time. Uh, I've seen that happen where a victim would say, you know, how come this isn't available to me? If, that, if I were, you know, if I had a purse snatching, it would be available, but now it's not available, why not? And so that's one way to actually referrals start opening up sometimes. The rain your mic's off, is that because you don't have anything to say or because you are uh, pushed the wrong button? So you seem surprised that I don't have anything to say, Howard. I, um, I, I couldn't believe it. So. <laughs> no, I don't know that I can add to that. I agree. I mean, I, I don't disagree that victims should have um, the opportunity to say that and I, uh, to, to go and meet with the person who harmed them. I think, I think that's one of the basics of restorative justice, that we talk about 
um, you know, how we provide opportunities for those kind of dialogues if people want that. And um, unfortunately, we're still not everyone is at that same place and um, that we're trying to work with that and we're building it. But I, I think absolutely if they want to, they should have the opportunity. We've got an interesting question here. Um, and probably has to do with our strong emphasis in in the North American context on this sort of, um, you know, zero tolerance and one strike or three strikes and you're out. But here's someone ask, how can you help people realize that youth may take responsibility in the moment for their actions? I'm assuming, especially if they've gone through a restorative justice process, but they may equally commit another crime in the future. That does not mean that the first RJ failed or that RJ itself is not effective. How best to convey that message to the public? I, I think one of the first things that I would say to that one is I wish, I wish I had always learned my lesson the first time um, with anything that I did. Um, we, I know didn't. You, we know you didn't. Yeah, you, you, you asked, and there, this is not a time to tell stories, Howard, so keep it down. Um, but, but that's the reality. You know, I think of restorative justice as something, you know, we, we plant seeds, and I think we're showing a different way of how we want relationships to be built and, and how we want uh, to develop healthy relationships through healthy dialogue. But to assume that uh, with all the other things going on in someone's life, that we come in um, and, and have this one dialogue to provide this one opportunity and that totally changes someone life, someone's life. Um, sometimes they are life changing, these dialogues, but, but not always. But I think we're, we're, we're planting a seed, we're, we're trying to develop and, and help communities think about healthier ways of relating to one another. But to assume it happens um, after one shot, I think that's really unrealistic and uh, it certainly didn't work for me. So. I think it's important to help people understand developmental issues. I mean, more and more information is coming out about how the brain develops, how maturity develops. Uh, we just had a conversation in my class last week with a former student who's doing student conduct things, and they're marrying restorative justice to, de to student development theory. And it's, it's really very powerful stuff because they're more and more aware of what a young person is uh, able to do and what they're not able to do and what helpful other what kind of interventions are helpful. So I think helping people understand that young people are developing, the brain is not fully developed, uh, and that has an impact, and that certainly affects this kind of behavior. A kid that's on a rebellious path is not going to be turned around necessarily by one, one meeting with a victim. We do know from the research that I've seen that they, if they do offend, it's usually not as serious, uh, but we can't guarantee it. Some people take several times. And might I just also add that we also know from the literature that for um, young boys, young men, that they actually move the age older. So the frontal lobe really isn't fully developed until age 26. I just want to throw that out there that that's um, older than for women. But, you know, until you got 26, they, they're going to continue to act, you know, maybe young and stupid. I don't know. I figured I could count on you to put that in there. <laughs> We're going to have to keep watching the time. There's one last question here, and it's really uh, about resourcing. And maybe um, I'll, I'll point this directly uh, to, to Lorraine first. Um, the question is, I'm currently working in a special school that caters to students with severe emotional or behavioral difficulties, many of whom are growing up within the juvenile justice system. And I've been trying to introduce RJ to our school. Where can I find or get information on setting up RJ programs in schools? I feel like I'm currently, or I am currently, the only one with any knowledge or exposure to RJ. Well, I don't know where this person is located, but um, you know, certainly in terms of resources, one of the things I would suggest, um, you know, there there is a little book of restorative disciplines for schools, which might be a way just to introduce um, what the concepts are. Uh, to, to those within the school. I know there was one, um, there's one school district in Wisconsin that, um, well, they got funding to do this, but one of the things, I, I forget now what they call it, I think I actually talk about it in the little book, where they would um, provide um, a suffer conversation 
uh, to go and they would have um, book study time. And so they would get different books that talk about restorative discipline or restorative justice, and they would read through them together. So it helps them, again, to be together to have a conversation about what restorative justice could look like within their specific school that they were working in. So I thought that was a really helpful way just to introduce it. It wasn't someone coming in saying, this is what you have to do. It's them figuring out together by reading some of the resources what would work in their school and what wouldn't. So just providing those resources might be one way to do it. Um, depending on where they're located, I mean, if someone, if they want to contact me, I can see if I, I, I mean, maybe I know someone um, in the region where they're located that could hook them up with a connection if they want someone to come in and talk uh, with their staff or administrators. I'd be happy to do that. There is there is quite a growing literature that might be useful. I mean, the little book is is very informative and it's only four ninety five. So and it's actually you can get a quantity for two fifty or something. So that is often used. There are other ones like uh, where's my thing? Nancy Riesenberg book. Uh, Circle on the Square, Building Community and Repairing Harm in Schools is, is a good book, and there that one just happened to be in reach here. But there are there's a there's a growing literature that's that's really quite useful for this. Yeah, Wonderful. Right. yeah I can't believe you don't have one of mine on your desk, Howard. <laughs> I have to get up for it, but I do have one here. <laughs> it, it's just yeah, it's just come out in uh, in Brazil too. You know, did you get your copy yet? No, I haven't gotten my copy yet, but I heard that it was. Yeah, it looks very nice. Oh, they said I was supposed to get a copy. Well, you'll probably get it. <laughs> Wonderful. This has been a very rich and, and important discussion. Thank you both to Howard and Lorraine. And I hope that this has been informative for all of you who've joined us. We are really thankful to have you here uh, with us for this webinar. I'm going to be uh, turning the time over to Jen Bricker now for the last few minutes. And she has a few announcements and some closing remarks. Thank you again for joining us and Howard and Lorraine, thank you very much for your time, experience and your expertise. This has been very important. Thanks for hosting. Thank you all for being on here. It's been great. Hi everyone. Can you see me? You can't see me. All right. Jen, it looks like you need to turn your video camera on still. It's coming. There you go. Got it. You hear me too? Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell you about one more upcoming webinar. It's going to be on December 5th with Elaine Zook Barge, and the topic is Trauma and Restorative Justice. You can email CJP at EMU to get more information about that and to register. You can also, there are two online courses that are coming up. One is called Justice and Transition Restorative and Indigenous Approaches. <laughs> in post-war context. That's going to be January 15th through February 12th. That's going to be with Carl, who you were introduced to this evening, if you did not yet know him. There's another class going to be Recovering the Vision, Conversations on Restorative Justice. That will be with Howard. And both of those are now being offered for uh, both for credit and for training. So if you'd prefer not to get the, the school credit, the university credit, you can do it just for training. I think that justice and transition will be $400 for training, and the recovering the vision will be $500. You can click that link right there in the PowerPoint to get more information on those. And finally, if you'd like to hear, learn more about what we do here at EMU, there are undergraduate programs with a peace building and development major, graduate programs such as the Masters in Conflict Transformation, there's a seminary, there's Summer Peace Building Institute, which is a few weeks where people can come and just take one class per week. And then there's STAR, which is a, a trauma resilience training. Thank you all for coming. That's all I have, Carl, you want to give? All right, we want to thank everyone for participating. And, um, and we look forward to having you come back and join us again for the next webinar. And Howard and Lorraine, thanks again, and all the best as you continue to do your important work. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>